in Daniel 1 to 7, we find an example of young people who God endowed with specific skills and abilities to enable them to function in exile in such a distinguished way as to position them uh, for some special tasks that he had designed for them. David and his three friends were to become national leaders. And all that we are pinned on the fact that God had given them some very, very special and very specific gifts and endowments. Similarly, God has given each of us some mundane gifts designed to enable us to serve Him. Um, most who see such endowments and gifts as having been given to us to promote themselves and put them in advantageous positions against others or over others. All right. Now, even spiritual gifts are the same. You know, when we recognize that God has given us some people who have gifts of of um, uh, uh, of the spirit in various dimensions. You know, some people can preach, some can teach, some have evangelistic gifts, some are apostles. You know, some can perform signs, wonders, miracles, and so on and so forth. All these are spiritual gifts that come from God. But unfortunately, many of us look at such gifts only from the perspective of what advantages they give us here and now. Many people don't recognize their gifts, whether they're mundane or spiritual, as things that are to be used in the service of God. Uh, when we may think of doing it, uh, we, we may appear to be using them in the service of God, but at the end of the day, when it is you alone profiting from it, when you are not even consciously investing this in a way to as to give you spiritual rewards in the life hereafter, you are missing the point. All right now, these gifts are distributed according to abilities. I remember when we were looking at the Luke 19 version of this, uh, this same parable that um, uh, Precious asked a question relating to whether, uh, uh, you know, people don't have different gifts according to their abilities. And we did point to this uh, Matthew 25 version of the same parable. Whereas in the Luke version, he gave them the same gift, all right, the same endowment. In this particular version, we're talking about people who have different levels of giftings, each according to their own abilities. These endowments were, uh, were determined, uh, this minute, yes. Uh, not only according to type, but also according to degrees, all right? So we all have them. So supposing somebody has uh, the same type of gift or endowment as another, he may not have it to the same degree as the other person has, all right? It's important to remember always that we are not all equally gifted their lives comparing themselves negatively against others as far as abilities go. So you say, well, I'm not as good a preacher as that other person. I'm not as good as a teacher as that other person. I'm not as good as good as a leader as that other person. And, and you know, all your life you are striving to become like that other person. You are copying the other person. You are even using terms of the other person in a bid to become like that person. And that's what you're pursuing. You're not that person. You can never be that person. Don't try to imitate that person. Be yourself. Give to the level you have been gifted to give. Don't compare yourself negatively against somebody else who has a higher dimension of the same gift that you have. Limit yourself. Let everybody serve according to the level of faith God has given him. That's how Paul puts it, all right? And the point being made is that you should know your limitation and stay within it. 
Don't struggle to be like somebody else. Don't compete with anybody else. Don't compare yourself negatively against anybody else. Just because you have the same set of endowments with another does not mean that you have been endowed to the same degree or that God is expecting the same level of returns from you as he is from that person. No, God knows the level he has given you and his expectation of you is only limited to the level to which he has gifted you. That's a very important thing to note. You will only be held accountable for the degree of your own endowment. They cannot compare you with somebody else, all right? Uh, we live in a system where we, are, we, we grade people uh, according to how they compete with each other. God doesn't work like that. God grades people according to the level to which they have made use of what he has given them. In other words, you are compared to yourself, to what you could have been, not to what somebody else has succeeded in being. Somebody else may be more endowed with, than yourself. Each is given according to his own ability. If the master gave you only five bags of gold, he will not expect you to perform the same, to the same extent as a person who has been given 10 bags of gold, all right? The master's expectation of each of us is limited to the extent of gifts he has given us. So com stop comparing yourself to other people. Start comparing yourself with yourself. Are you doing the best you can do with what you have? Then just limit yourself to that. Be rejoice in that ability to be the best you can be. Compare yourself with yourself. Seek to be the best you can be by yourself. It is therefore important that we should be fair to ourselves while assessing our gifts. Don't compare with another. Base your assessment on what you have been given and the extent you have been, to which you have give, been given it, all right? I can't compare myself to Billy Graham. I mean, I'm not Billy Graham, all right? God has given me some evangelistic gifts, okay, but not to the same degree as he gave Billy Graham. All right, he's going to judge me against what he has given me and judge Billy against what he has given him. All right, to keep comparing your achievements with those of others is an unfair, in an unfair manner, is to condemn yourself to a life of misery. You'll always be miserable, you know, but when you do that, such an attitude can keep one from performing to their optimum. All right. So when you keep comparing yourself against others, you are, you are not even going to uh, be able to achieve according to the highest you could have achieved because uh, you spend all your time thinking, oh, how can I be like this person? How can I do it like that other person? And oh, that person is you know, doing it more than me, so it's achieving more than me. No, 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 no. You, keep, you should think in terms of what is it what gifts have I been given? To what extent have I been given those gifts? Am I utilizing my gifts to the best of my ability? Am I achieving the best result that I could possibly achieve given the gifts I have been given? That's your concern. All right? So two of the three servants invested their assets properly in the story we're looking at. Remember, the master was going on a journey so he gave them uh, resources, his own resources, all right? And he gave it to them, each according to his ability. So each one was given according to the, the, what the master already knew about them, all right? So the master gives us according to what he already knows about our own constitution. Now, what did they do? Two of the three of them invested their assets productively. All right, we must first recognize our personal assets and endowments, you know, uh, um, yes, our endowments uh, as, as such, all right? And then, so the question is, what is your own endowment? That's the question. What's your own personal gift? Have you assessed them? Have you reckoned them, all right? Uh, if I asked you, what is the special thing God has given you to invest? 
what is it? Have you ever listed them? All right. If we are living in these end times and we want to prepare ourselves for the fact that we will soon be called to give account when Jesus comes or when he calls us home, we will soon be asked to give account. What are we going to be giving account of? List your gifts, list your endowments, spiritual as well as ordinary. List them, all right? Then we must deliberately invest them. Begin to think of, so how am I investing this asset I have, all right? Many people only hope that they are in, they're investing their assets and, and endowments, that just hope that they are but they are not sure, they are not de deliberate about what they are doing. If you asked him, how, how are you investing this particular resource in the service of God? He really doesn't have a clue because he's not doing it consciously. He's not doing it deliberately. Now, these people, the man who, who invested 10 and got 10, as well as the man who invested five and got five more, you know, those people were deliberate. They were conscious. They knew what they were doing. They knew what they were being given. And they invested it in a very certain way. I'm asking you, what are your assets? What are your endowments? What are your gifts? And how are you consciously and deliberately investing them in the service of God? The carry on. Uh, with life, that's what normal people do. Normally, just like uh, just living for themselves, and then hope that somehow along the line they they would be serving the kingdom without deliberately planning to do so. So, if you ask somebody, uh, "What are you doing for God?" I say, "Well, I, I know I must be doing something. Uh, well." Uh, at least uh, we, we do some things that maybe I don't quite remember them, but I, I'm sure that, that I must have been doing something. No, it shouldn't be that way. If you are going to get five out of five or ten more for the ten you're investing, you must do it consciously. You must do it deliberately. You must know what you are doing. You must know what you're investing. It shouldn't just be vague. It shouldn't just be by the way. It shouldn't be accidental. It should be deliberate. It should be conscious. It should be what you know that you are doing. Finally, we say here, this would only lead to minimized service and minimized returns. How are you deliberately investing your own endowments? If this series is to lead to anything at all it ought to be that it should lead you to a determined deliberate conscious re-examination of the gifts and assets that god has given you and a deliberate attempt to begin to improve on what you are investing them in uh, consciously deliberately in a determined manner Look at uh, the story of the rich fool. As we said earlier, some people do not recognize the fact that their endowments are primarily given to them to invest in such a way as to optimize their chances in the life hereafter. I cannot say this enough. Whatever God has given us by way of gifts or endowments, it is for us to invest in such a way that we optimize our own chances or our returns in the life, the life to come. That's really what it is. That's why you are given whatever you are given, whatever gifts you have, whatever abilities you have, has been given to you to invest in this life in such a way that you improve your chances in the life hereafter. This is where we return to the story of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12. In verse 13 of that chapter, a man comes to Jesus uh, to request that he com commands his brothers, his brother to share their inheritance. He, apparently, the man's father had just died. And he had a brother. 
and it appears as if both of them were followers of Jesus. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had the reason to come and report his brother to Jesus. So they were disciples of Jesus. So he comes to Jesus and he says, please tell my brother to yeah. of, of, of our father's uh, inheritance that he has left for us. Now Jesus' answer in verses 14 and 15 may appear shocking uh, to a casual reader. Let's, let's look at it. Um, Luke 12, Luke 12, there you go, 13 and 14. All right. Luke 12, 13 and 14. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And this is a this is a very interesting answer that Jesus gives this man. All right, uh, one would have thought that he, this man is being cheated, obviously by his brother. Uh, the brother is taking advantage of the fact that he is his older brother, and. Uh, and uh, probably seized all the all the inheritance and would not give the younger one anything. And the younger one said, well, since we are both Christians, uh, followers of Jesus, I'm going to go to the master. And I'm sure once I report to the master, he will order you to share the thing you call him. He goes to Jesus. And Jesus says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. So Jesus is not looking at the justice or injustice of the sharing. Jesus is looking at the heart of this young man. And what does he see there? He sees greed. He wants this thing because he wants to spend it on himself. He wants these resources that his father has left him so that it will give him a better chance in life or a better life or so he thought. All right? And Jesus said, it's all greed. It's all greed. What I can see in your heart is greed. And then he added All right. Life does not consist of a man, the abundance of a person's possessions. All right. Now that's very different from the way most people look at life. So people think of assets that they have as a means of increasing their possessions because they think of life as in consisting of the abundance of their possessions. So the more I possess, the more successful I am. What we are trying to say today is that what we are giving are assets that we are supposed to use to serve God in such a way as to receive rewards uh, prepare ourselves for rewards in the life hereafter. All right? That is really the reason why Jesus said the kind of things he said to this man in verses 14 and 15. All right? We are reminded here that many people see their endowments as merely for present enjoyment and advantage. So uh, when my father dies, I'm going to inherit his house, I'm going to inherit 25 cows, I'm going to inherit, uh, and then he's counting the money and, you know, what it will do to his bottom line in his account, and so on and so on. That's all he's thinking about, all right? He's not thinking about, how do I invest this thing in such a way as to profit me in the life that is to come? Jesus called on his inquirers to be on their guard against the danger of greed. The quality of life is not to be measured quantitatively. And not to say this is the amount of assets I now have garnered. Therefore, I'm a bigger man or I'm a more successful man. Our success should be measured by what we have reserved for us in heaven. 
then he goes on to tell the story of of this rich man um uh, just a minute of this rich man who thought that he had cornered it all all right uh, his farm yielded so heavily that he thought he could now sit back and enjoy it all jesus reminds us in verses 20 and 21 that in the light of the life is life here on earth is finite it is foolish to measure its success merely in what we amass materially but that's how we look at ourselves even that's how we look at others you know who is the most successful man we think oh who has a bigger bottom line all right who has the more money in the bank who has more resources and we talk about the richest man in africa talk about the richest man in the world and things like that and all we measure is material all right we need to utilize our assets or endowments in a way that make us rich towards god that's what jesus was talking about in that chapter all right rich towards god in other words as god measures wealth that is to say by the assets you have amassed in heaven are you rich are you well off how much have you amassed in heaven that ought to be what you are thinking about and the only way to amass in heaven is by using the endowments you have here use it in such a way as to provide for yourself riches in the life to come i'm afraid this is where we will have to stop today we'll continue this uh, uh, uh thinking next week by the grace of god but i'm very happy to take questions or comments now wow thank you sir uh, so profound investing our lives investing our resources investing our endowments being intentional about it being intentional about it any questions anybody with any question certainly we are going to go there that life to come certainly we'll all get there but are we going to be rich there or poor we have to be intentional about that we have to start investing now any question uh, so there, there are people who feel they are very poor they don't have they always um, glorify poverty they don't have enough materially and um, they don't even see what they are gifted with to be able to invest they're always looking to people to give to them uh, how how would this be useful to them what what must we say to them to empower them to also be intentional about investing right in next week yes we'll continue this teaching next week we are going to see that we're going to look at how um, the assets get transferred and we're going to check on how much is it worth. Now, some people, people don't think about these things, but they're all in the Bible, all right? How do I transfer my assets from here to heaven? What's the mechanism of transfer? And how much is it worth when it gets there? How do they measure the worth? Okay? Uh, and I think I'll leave it till we get to it so yeah. that we don't anticipate it too much. Like to but I'm saying mm -hmm. it does not depend so much on quantity mm -hmm. that you actually have or give. You know, uh, what determines it, we'll talk about. Yes. All right, any other question? Yes, come hope from the tournament, yes. Yes, man of God, go ahead. Does the come who you are online we want to hear you? Yes.
<laughs> we can see your hand, your picture is there. Come home from Botswana, please speak. Uh, thank you so much for the good teaching, uh, Pastor Osuna. Uh, my question is that how can we have a good setup that will allow other people not to be spectators in the church, maybe favoring other people who seems that their endowments gift seems to be their a favorite people and others are spectators. What setup can we have that all people can use their uh, different endowment in the in the service? Yes. Uh, are you a pastor, brother? Yes, I'm a pastor. Okay, very good. Um, the responsibility of the pastor, first of all, is to help the people identify their areas of endowment. You must have a session with each person uh, where you work with him to get to the point where you actually identify what are your specific areas of endowment, whether they be material, intellectual, or spiritual, okay? And then you help the person to assess or evaluate the level of that endowment, okay? All right. Then you deploy the person. See, many pastors don't see themselves as they ought to be seeing themselves. Pastors are like managing directors, all right, in a business. You are not just a Sunday, Sunday preacher. You are, you are managing the lives of people, okay? So you have to help them to identify which area, which specific area they are to invest this their endowment in, okay? Now, let me give you an example. Uh, here is a young man. He is very strong, very energetic. You know, in fact, he plays football very, very well. Uh, we could say that one of his endowments is in the area of sports, okay? So then how do we utilize this young man? How do we utilize his gift in the church setting, okay? Could it be used in the youth work among the youth in the church to organize them in sports? All right. Could it be used in sports evangelism? You know, where we organize the youth in our church to go out to the community and engage the young people in coaching them to play football. Could this young man be useful? And through that means, maybe during the halftime, we stop and read the scripture and we preach the gospel and we pray and then we go back to playing, you know. These are some of the strategies we have used in evangelism in the past, you know, among young people. Point is, do you, can you identify somebody in your church who, through his giftings in sports, can be utilized uh, in such a way that he can become useful rather than just expecting this young man to become like a, a preacher, you know, in the church. That's how we misuse people, you know identify his area of gifting, help him identify the level of that gifting, deploy him suitably, and then evaluate him from time to time. That would be my suggestion. No, thanks. God bless you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you so much.